So Isaac, the, the big reason why I had you on is, is your your article on there's going to be a war in Montana. And obviously it doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be a war in Montana. What your article discusses about what you have seen change in the state of Montana as far as people relocating goes and this whole uh, <laughs> foundry and taps. Uh, what are some other crazy ass fucking uh, brewery names we can think of? Cracker and... Um, and yeah. fucking uh, table, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like this, this, um, these, these uh, downtowns which we've talked about. God, the man, refinery, I, I the refinery, yeah, the, yeah. the refinery <laughs> and table. Uh, what are some, let's think of some other ones here. Hang on, give me a second. Uh, yeah. This, this microbrewery and uh, and <laughs> chicken finger, fried chicken finger. Uh, expat, are you there? Hey everyone, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I was just I was just giving an introduction on why you're here right now. Isaac Simpson is uh, in the chats, and we, we're decided to discuss a little bit about there's going to be a war in Montana. Why don't you tell us some of the some of the names for uh, breweries you came up with? <laughs> oh gosh, uh, I I don't think I can surpass um, what Mr. Simpson wrote about in his article. <laughs> you know, oak and barley. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, off the top of my head, it's kind of tough. But I know. I was he came up with some really some funny the, ones. Yeah. Wait, so me, me, and gravy. me and X better be going back for two, uh, for, go ahead, maybe three weeks straight since reading the article with stupid fucking uh, brewery names. <laughs> brewery, bro, uh, boutique, furniture stores, uh, combination <laughs> furniture stores and coffee shops. <laughs> Yeah, twig and whistle. Twig and whistle. Twig and whistle. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a real one, though? Musky, musky and barley. Hang on, I got him. Musky and barley, wood fire and hops, uh, art scene and crackle, barrel and rooster. Crackle. Barrel and rooster. Oh, barrel and rooster. Like Wait, axe and garnish. <laughs> <laughs> I like wait, cracker wait. and hoe. I came up with that. Cedar and flax. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> flax. Yeah, throw flax in there. So why don't you, uh, uh, Isaac? Why don't you tell us a little bit of the premise of this article, and then we can get lost in the weeds on it. Sure. So, <clears throat> so um, you know, I went to Montana uh, like six years ago, and I went to the same family reunion thing that I went before. And it was Bozeman mixed with this ranch that's like a very lavish, one of the best ranches in Montana. And uh, coming through Bozeman and uh, going to the ranch, I noticed just in six years, there was a huge, huge difference. Bozeman appeared completely different. The vibe on the ranch seemed completely different. And then because my wife got COVID, I sort of like accidented into staying in Three Forks, Montana, which is 20 minutes away from Bozeman, but is completely bright red Trump country. And we just accidentally ended up staying there, basically, because we got kicked out of the of the shitty motel we were staying in in, in uh, Bozeman because there was like a Kenny Chesney concert. So we had to go to Three Forks, right? And Three Forks is like bright red. And then you go 20 minutes away and it is like rainbow. Fl you might as well be in WeHo. I swear to God, you might as well be in West Hollywood. It is like gay shit everywhere. You know, as you said, uh, you know, twig and whistle, <laughs> the refinery, the refinery flatbread restaurant with rainbow flag, the feminist bookstore who's like, oh no, don't come in with no mask. Um, you know, the uh 13 third wave coffee shops. I literally saw Alexander Skarsgard, the celebrity, at a coffee shop in Bozeman, Montana. And before six years ago, Bozeman was still kind of had a little bit of like cowboy charm. Whereas now, Bozeman, it's fucking toast, dude. That place is fucking toast. It is straight up West Hollywood. Like, there is no remnant of Montana in there at all. It's gone. It's done. Is that... Um, so, that's that's people moving there, right? 
No. Well, so the point of the piece is that it's not people moving there. It's money moving there. Okay. So it, it's, it's real estate investment trusts. It's uh, private equity groups. They're making these work, live, uh, you know, work, live. You can live right. as a tourist and not yeah, yeah. your home. Right. Yeah. 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 Look, yeah. Look at this shitty, horrible fucking architecture. We all know this architecture, right? I talk about this in the piece. It's this, what they call it, Lomo. It's like that sh- horrible, shitty condo architecture that's popping up everywhere. That's like the cheapest, lowest bidder architecture. And it just looks like these like generic ass apartments. And there's like, it's everywhere in Bozeman. And it all says work, play, live, <laughs> you know? And there's local, I'm putting in quotes, IPA on tap. And there's like, oh, a delicious rigatoni dish. It's it's literally just totally every dollar spent in those places is going to fucking New York or whoever owns this shit. You know, it's it's these banks that own this shit. So they're developing real estate in these places and they're just taking it over. And what do they do? They put rainbow flags on fucking everything. Jeez. They rainbow flag the whole shit. <laughs> oh my God. So you're saying you, you could be a sodomite on a bike and get a nice IPA and have a yes. chicken finger for like- Right, and you're not going to get raped. You're a nice woman. And what are you going to do? You're going to work your job. You're going to buy a fucking $2,000 Cannondale bike and you're going to be a project manager at fucking LinkedIn, and you're going to spend your entire day buying shit on fucking Reformation. You know, I, that, that's what you're going to do with your life. And, and, and that's what they want. Let, let me ask you something. Have you uh, researched this in depth about why that is happening? Because uh, on this channel, we go into, we get re- we get lost in the weeds on what is happening uh, at, in Bozeman on the microcosm and why that uh, why that's the state of uh, state of things. No, tell me what you've tell me what you found out. Well, I, I am. I mean, you've heard me go on and on and on about this for the past five years now. Why don't you enlighten I uh, enlighten our listener? Well, what do you want to know specifically? Well, in in a sense, uh, this is uh, called smart growth policy. So the idea is, how do I put this? Uh, it kind of what we were discussing earlier on about how you will own nothing and be happy. So yeah. you can live in the downtown Bosman. You can treat the city square like it's your living room, but you live in a 350 square foot apartment with a house plant and perhaps a small dog. <laughs> and you know the rents the rents will be uh, equal to that of like Williamsburg, Brooklyn or in Los Angeles, yet you're not actually living in LA or in New York City. You're living in Bosman. Yeah. So the the streets will become uh congested because of again because of smart growth policies uh in in a sense this is like uh, the nudge nudge theory uh coined by Cass sussman where okay we're gonna make it really in we're gonna make it super inconvenient for you to park for you to have a car there's no place for you to park your car so you can rent a bike provided by citibank yes right yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you can ride to your favorite uh your favorite uh foundry for yeah. a, a local ride to uh, the foundry yeah. right you can go to the foundry and have your uh, 15 dollar ipa yeah. <laughs> where it's kind of this cheap, cheap uh, post-industrial look where you see like the electrical conduit and the ceilings painted black with f- terrible fluorescent lighting. The, uh, or they have a tin, they have a, they have a tin ceiling, you know, the tin, like the printed oh. tin, you know, right. that's like, kind of, yeah, that's the thing. Right. And you don't have, you don't necessarily have a balcony. Like, uh, like a favela. Yeah, yeah, it's a favela, right? It's a, it's a favela, favela architecture. It's a, it's a, yeah. right. it's, a, it's a sterilized version. Well, of and, and the thing that the thing that we don't even realize is when they make those favela architecture bullshit horrible buildings, the reason why it says live, play, work on it is because they get subsidies from the government, yes. state or yeah. federal, to make it ten percent affordable. Yeah. So what they do is they have three apartments in there or, or whatever, how many apartments that are, that are affordable apartments. 
And who do those apartments go to? People they know. Yes, right. <laughs> so it's, dude, I, I know a guy in L.A., fucking one of the most fucking rich Jewish guys I know in L.A. Lives in, he's a writer. He lives in downtown L.A. in his, like, family's apartment building, and he pays $600 a month because he's in one of the buildings that has these uh, low-income units in it, and he is the one fucking living in it. <laughs> Even though he's one of the richest people I fucking know. You have to also realize he is that the, 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 right. people, so it, yeah, the yeah. people paying uh, the people paying uh, uh, market rate are subsidizing that individual. Exactly. They're subsidizing him. They think there's some like, oh, there's a low-income family living in there. There's not a fucking low-income family in there. <laughs> It's just a rich Jew. <laughs> exactly. It's a fucking rich Jew. That's it's amazing. A fucking rich Jew in there. <laughs> you know? Does he so like? It, does he like slink out so no one sees him, or does he care? Yeah. <laughs> fucking, this guy is shameless, dude. He doesn't fucking care at all. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what I'm saying. It's like, oh yeah, we have three apartments, and we got we got a funding from the federal government to the tune of you know whatever a million dollars for this place because we're. We're providing low-income housing in Bozeman. It's really important. And then who fucking lives there? Not a fucking low-income person. It's some friend of theirs. You know, like, that's how it fucking goes, man. It's, it's just corruption, like, all the way through. So, again, you see what's happening in California. You see what's happening in New York. And now it's spreading to a place like Montana. Yeah. The same thing. So, in a sense, you know... Uh, uh, quoting a good friend of our, ours, uh, Tom Kaczynski, you're, you're not necessarily running away from, uh, you know, whatever, uh, riots or, um, you know, ethnic conflict. You're running away from politics. So, you know, that's not a good premise on why you're fleeing a specific location. You're not going to Montana for the culture. You're running away from California because of, of, because of uh, politics. And that tends to breed a lot of animosity with the locals. I mean, again, I live in Appalachia, and it seems that the people that are, you know, Bible belters and, and Baptists are propping up these 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 nodes of uh, people that adhere to woke ideology. Money theism comes to mind. It's a coined term by the foreign minister of Singapore in the seventies and eighties, where he. Uh, notice the uh, a very strange uh, group of expats kind of like subverting the local uh, uh, the local culture of Singapore, saying like, "Where did you guys come from? Like, you you can't treat Singapore uh, like it's your uh, an extension of your living room. Like this, this, we live here. Like you don't you have to listen to our rules. You have to adhere to our culture, our policy, so on and so forth." And that's kind of why Singapore is kind of like this very strange uh, dictatorship where if you're co – I forgot. It's like if you, can't, you do something You can't stupid, chew gum. You can't you chew gum. Nice <laughs> you can't chew gum or you get, you get caned like 50, 50 – <laughs> last year, 50, 50 times or something like that. Yeah, man. <laughs> hey, so um, expat, why don't you uh, weigh in for a moment because you're the one that in uh, introduced uh, <laughs> Isaac's work to me. Oh, yeah. Well, a great article, uh, Isaac. Um, it really blew up on Twitter, so that's where I think I saw it. Um, it got written up a little bit in the right-wing blogosphere, too. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if you saw that, but um, there's one blogger in particular named Aesop. Uh, Raconteur Report is the URL, uh, .blogspot.com. Uh, um, I don't think he was too happy with the article. <laughs> um <laughs> I, I'm not exactly sure what his argument was, but I, I think he, I, I think the premise was that um, basically uh, this has happened before in many times and places throughout the country uh, that you have waves of migrants, domestic migrants that come in and transform the city, the country, uh, and then you know the natives uh, complain about it, but ultimately they do nothing, right? They just move out or they adapt, and you know that's what's happening here. Is there, um, is there... Oh, wait, 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 no, no, hold on, hold on. Oh, sorry, Chris, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I, I, just to add on to what he's saying, um, as far as them moving in and the natives doing nothing or leaving, yeah. um, in line with that, why do you think they chose a place like Bozeman 
to migrate that money and make this happen? Why that place? Can, can I can I take that one? Sure. Uh, because of it's a pro property right state, so it's easy for them to come in with uh, you know bags of cash and and start uh, uh, implementing these policies. And also, a lot of these policies have already been laid down maybe 15, 20 years ago, adhering to smart growth policy. So it's already, the, the framework was already there. It just was a, it's a matter of time before the money from California, New York moves over there on top of that being uh, kind of a, a, you know laissez faire as far as taxing policy goes. So oh, we fucked up New York. Uh, we made all our money, you know, bleeding these fucking millennials dry because they can have uh, you know a, a fucking frappuccino uh, at the at the corner. So, okay, why don't we take all the money we made after bleeding all these people from their, you know, from their rent money and move it to a place like Montana. On top of it, you had COVID where a lot of these landlords are getting fucking slammed with their people leasing out their units, their tenants not paying rent. So like, okay, well, what can we do? All right, let's, let's liquidate some of our rental properties and go to a place like Utah, Tennessee, Montana, so on and so forth. Okay, go on. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm listening. You guys are talking. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I, I think you're right. I mean, I think that what you said is very insightful. Yeah, that's a, that's exactly what happened. I, I've studied this for the past ten years, and I, I'm just blown away at the speed in which this is happening now. And COVID was it was uh, caused a knock on effect for a lot of these hedge funds to move their their money from places like California and New York to places like Montana again, because they, they don't, they have no idea what, what, what New York is about. They have no idea what California is about. Like they have no idea who they're messing with. These people are, these guys are sharks as far as when, when it comes to real estate development goes, Oh, you laid, you already adopted smart growth policy. What's this in 1998 and you haven't done anything with it. We're going to bring all this money here. It's a new tax stream for you. You can start paving your roads. It's job growth, and of course, the construction companies are like all the construction companies are like all on board for this, even though they're they're uh, supplying the bricks to their own enslavement. They don't give a shit. Right. I um, I'd like to present a uh, a different view on it, and I don't know if it contradicts anything that you just said, but I see this as driven kind of by mass affluence. Ooh. Um, yeah, well, I mean, really, um, I, you know, we're talking about the uh, the supply side of it, right? We're talking about the companies that are moving in and profiting off this. But it's not it's not like China, where the government decides, okay, we're going to just make Bozeman the next, you know, Denver or something, and then they start building, and then people come. That's not that's not usually the sequence here. So people start moving there, and then the companies see an opportunity, and they study the market, and they say, wow, this is like a huge. Uh, growth opportunity. So let's start, you know, let's start building and building more. And I mean, you know, as much as we make fun of uh, places uh, like the um, cities described in this article, uh, people seem to like it and they move there and they, and they uh, shop at these stores and they work in these co-working spaces and they live in these shitty apartments uh, which, as terrible as they are, in many ways are better than, you know, the apartments uh, people had access to in the 70s or the 80s, right? So, I mean, it's, as much as I hate it, I see it more as a cultural problem, per se, than um, uh, than a problem of, of uh, bad local policies. Well, what's the cultural problem, though? Because it seems like you're saying it's actually better than it was before. Well... I wouldn't say it's better. It's actually probably much worse. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think it's just that uh, people are very pedestrian in their tastes. And um, they, I mean, look, if we're going to talk about economic problems, I think I think the core issue is uh, the unaffordability of everything. Uh, I don't think that's driven by specific companies. I think probably, you know, what, 43% uh, of millennials own homes. I think that number would be a lot higher if the cost of housing was lower. So, so I think if we're looking for a culprit here, we have to address the, uh, you know, uh, federal policies, the, uh, the banks, and the um, 
all the factors that are driving these spiraling costs, like mass immigration and everything else. Um, I wouldn't blame the developers per se. You know, I, I wouldn't blame you know the Bozeman City Council. Uh, I think they're just capitalizing on opportunities here. Mm -hmm. Well, but this same thing, like when when I published this article, the thing that I got most was people being like, "This exactly describes my town in Kentucky." You know, this exact thing is happening everywhere, mm -hmm. and, and what you're it's monoculture. Mm -hmm. yeah, what, what you're seeing is a global monoculture. You know, I, I went to Charleston, South Carolina, uh, not long ago, and I was so upset because you walk down the main drag of Charleston, South Carolina, and you're like, oh, I'm in Charleston, South Carolina. I'm going to see some South Carolina shit. Right. And it is South Carolina old houses filled with H&M and filled right. with, you know... Uh, oh. Starbucks and pot. You're right. <laughs> wait, wait, yeah, yeah. Crocker, yeah, right. Croc and fucking pot. Exactly. So what you're seeing is a global monoculture that's taking over all of these little these little places. And I, I don't think that that's necessarily like a good thing, you know? Yeah. No, it's not. There's no, no I, I would agree with that. Yeah. yeah. What, what, what you're saying, there's no difference between uh, Charleston, South Carolina to to uh, Bozeman, Montana. Right. There's no it's getting the away story. from it. It's the same shit. It's rainbow flags. You know what, what I mean? It's like, wait, wait, that's not what we want. That's not That's not even what the progressives want. You know what I mean? The progressives are sitting around being like, oh, we love diversity. Yet, really, what they want is this gray, shitty Starbucks world that is everywhere. Like, that yeah. sucks, man. Who wants that? Nobody wants that. Yeah. Well, they, they, the, the, before these policies get rolled out, you get this lip service that we're, it's going to be a uh, vibrant downtown. There's going to be boutique shops for right. you know, yeah, women, exactly. women to yeah. buy, you know, paternity <laughs> clothing, and you can have coffee and go shopping. And, and everyone's like, oh, that sounds really – we're all in favor of mom-and-pop stores, aren't we? Yeah, well, yeah. we are. That'd be great. Yeah, well, but but yeah. what you get Pretty is close. Dunkin' Donuts. You get well, Starbucks. You get H&M. You get what Starbucks. is it? I mean, why does that happen, though? Uh, you know, if uh, are they basically lying? I, I mean, are these city yes. councils lying? Uh huh. Yeah, man. They're so, lying. So, so why no, do they not, not have lying. rules? They're just like not smart enough to understand what's going on. You know, they, uh -huh. they, they, they're they don't know what's happening, and they're doing what they're doing the path of least resistance because there's money behind them. Right. There's tax. There's tax. Yeah, right. Money. It's a, they, they're operating based on money, and they're they're dumb bureaucrats. Yeah. Right, I mean, like, oh, are they going to do the right thing? No, they don't give a fuck. You also, you know, they're making the whatever Isaac, they can. Uh, here's the other thing, Isaac. You're leaving out is that also, you know, circling back to when I was talking about, like, oh, you, 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 uh, it, you like smart growth policy. I see here you've been signed up since 1998. You haven't done anything with it. What the federal government does, it gives it gives grant money to incentivize downtowns to do this type of work. Yeah. So uh, there's other things that are tied in with that grant money. So yeah. it would be like if you want your roads to be paved, well, you have to also have Drake Time Story out at your local library. Yep. Yeah. That's right. And, and, and so, yeah. Well, we don't like that part of the grant. Well, it's too bad. It's either it's either your downtown's going to be shit in another five to ten years. Or you accept this, uh, you accept this this grant money. So that's why you see uh, other other states that uh, are kind of impoverished. Again, we kind of look at like Alabama, Mississippi, West Virginia, you know, a few others that come to mind. Uh, you know, small downtowns that don't want to accept this type of grant money that fall into the wayside with fentanyl. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and you know this. You know, you get a w massive waves of immigration into the other downtown, subverting. Uh, you know, obviously like the labor uh, la wages as far as labor goes. So that's why you see some some locations like Bozeman that are like you know doing great. Look at it, it's vibrant. It's doing wonderful. Look how vi well vibrancy doesn't mean people are making money. That doesn't necessarily equate people are doing really well. M Mumbai's uh, hustling, bustling, but everyone makes like under a hundred bucks a year. Yeah, when, when I when I said they that they lie, um, I think they do on a certain level because, for example, in in my town, which is Southern Alberta, man, it's not that far away from Bozeman actually. Um, it 
the, the, I had, I, I, because I started a business here, I was in and out of the city, city hall so many fucking times. I kind of got to know how these people worked. And for example, here they, uh, they get a bunch of money. All these municipalities got money from the federal government, well, right. federal to provincial, provincial to municipality. And all that money comes with a, an ultimatum. What, what's, what's the word? Not ultimatum. Like a, there's a, there's a, a catch, right? To it's the a money. Stipulation. A stipulation to the money. You have to build these green lanes. You have to, okay. you have to, I, one of, and <laughs> one of the things that they were trying to sell around my province was, Hey, who wants this money? If you want, if you take it and it's a lot of money. If you take it, you've got to build a safe injection site in your city, right? <laughs> and and they shopped it around, and the town that I'm in now accepted it, and it just destroyed the city. Wow. And, and the 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 mayor and all the people on the council know exactly where that money came from. They know exactly what the stipulation was for that money. But if anybody tried to ask, they would lie. They would absolutely right. lie, and that and that and that that safe injection site lasted uh, about, I think, around six years, and it ended up getting shutting shut down because the people that were hired to run it were um, stealing all the money. Right? It was just corruption to the core. So you've got you've got this you've got this agenda. 21 agenda 2030 money there you go. coming in from the federal government and it trickles down to the provincial and to the municipal it's it's designed that way and and they're like they're handing out the sweet money with these stipulations and it's cor because it's corruption from the, from the beginning as it trickles down it ends up in that example a safe injection site which just dirties the whole the whole city there's just crime goes up. Um, there's fucking junkies everywhere. The local neighborhoods are now doing their own neighborhood watches because the police aren't doing their job. And then the entire thing gets shut down because the people running it were stealing the money. Right? So they do lie about that because these local municipalities, they know where the money's coming from. They know absolutely where it's coming from, and they know exactly what they have to do. And it's like, if you want this money, you have to spend this much on this, and then it'll keep coming. The gravy train won't stop as long as you do this. So, yeah, yeah. don't don't. Chris, I think that yeah. Sorry, no, go ahead. No, no, no. I'm 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 done. I'm, I think that's ahead. a great point. You know, I mean, I think that that's the thing that the left doesn't realize. You know, the the left doesn't understand that this is not. Oh, the left or the right, really. But, I mean, I think the right is getting it more. But the left doesn't get that, like, they see Ronald Reagan as like, oh, you know, it's the, uh, it's the, the, the government is the problem, right? right. They react against that. They're like, oh, no, but the government is, it helps people. They don't understand that the government and the corporations, it's one thing. It's, it's like they're working together. It's called and fascism. It, <laughs> yeah, that's and, right. Yeah. According to Mussolini. <laughs> right, right. But like hidden fascism. And, and that's why you're so right to use the word gravy train. That's the word I always use too. It's like, you know, we have these ballot propositions in California. So we have direct democracy here, which is the stupidest thing in history. But so we have these ballot propositions that, you know, thing to, to for gay marriage, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And of course, like interestingly, gay marriage, of course, was like the black population voted 80% against the gay marriage. <laughs> like, hey, no one ever wants yeah. to talk about that. But uh, anyway, we have these ballot propositions, these referendums. And you look at the way these referendums are written, and then it also tells you who the biggest supporters of these referendums are. The biggest supporters of the referendums are always like Blackstone and BlackRock. Right. And they have some interest in one side or the other. Either it's like rent control or, you know, zoning, whatever it is, right? And they have some interest. And it's not just Blackstone. It's always like Blackstone and the NAACP. Mm -hmm. Like, together. You know, like, we together. 
don't support rent control because blah, blah, blah. I mean, I'm sounding like a leftist right now. I'm just trying to give an example. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's the gravy train, man. It's the gravy train. Exactly yeah. like you're saying. It's, it's these companies that are, yeah, it's like not only are they building gay housing in Bozeman, they're getting paid by the federal government to do it. Yes. So there's no, there's no risk. They have no risk. You well, know what I mean? They're, they're, they're just straight up getting paid to do it. Except for a, a moral failing. You know, like not for nothing. How do ideologues explain the mangy coffee colored junkie covered in born to lose tattoos asleep right. with well, a that and and so outside right. a bougie Pilates right. studio? <laughs> like, in, like, how can you sit there and have brunch and never ending mimosas, pictures of mimosas? Talking to your girlfriends, uploading fi pictures onto Instagram. Meanwhile, there's a fucking flasher in front of you. Yeah, right. Well, and that's what we're seeing, right? We're seeing now the uh, the results of this. You know, we're seeing the result of the gravy train. And the result of the gravy train is everything sucks. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. It's amazing. Right? It's am Oh, sorry. Um, I was just going to quickly say it's amazing how quickly so many people will sell out for the gravy train. I yeah. just wanted to say oh, that. For very little money. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like you read about these traders, you know, these people that get indicted for, like, you know, handing secrets to China or whatever, and it's like they got paid, you know, $30,000 or something. So yeah. Was it worth it? Um, well, I was just going to say, going back to the issue of the chain stores, because that features prominently in, uh, in your article, Isaac, um, what would be the possible solutions to that i mean should these local uh you know city councils municipalities should they just ban chain stores i mean is that because i think that's what they do in europe right so as a result you'll have more local shops but prices will be higher um possibly right and uh there might be less demand uh for those uh products uh, than we see with uh, starbucks or h&m I don't know. I'm just kind of spitballing here because I don't really know what the answer is. But but one other point I would make is that, um, I mean, there are probably thousands of small towns across the country that um, are much more traditional, that sort of um, conform to this idea of the uh, uh, 1950s style, you know, walkable downtown, uh, small local mom and pop stores, no chain stores, et cetera. And um most of them are dying, mm -hmm. right? Most of them are becoming depopulated. So I, and I'm not saying this to um, attack the idea of traditional towns or to endorse, you know, this horrible sort of globo monoculture, but, um, you know, I don't know what the solution is, right? Because people seem to like this garbage. Well, on one, on one hand, just quickly, um, what, what I, from my experience, it could have stopped. It could have stopped at the local municipal level, if the if the community or or the council in charge had the balls to say no. Mm -hmm. Really, like they 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 could have said when the gravy train came rolling in, when Klaus Schwab's money came rolling in, on a on a local municipal level, they can't. They could have said no, and and it would have been, I guess. From a financial perspective, it, it would have been harder, but it would have been the right thing to do. Well, the, uh, is it, is it, I, say I, no me, to Starbucks, for example. If Starbucks me, wants to open a store, you say no. Let me interject here. You have to realize something. This is a word that's thrown a lot around when it comes to these type of developments. Is something called stakeholders. Right. So it's not actually the voting block of that that city or that town, that hamlet, whatever you want to call it. It's stakeholders. So what they've done is that the stakeholder t it tends to bribe those uh, those city council officials. I can tell you that's that's the case that is on Long Island, which is like, what, second to Chicago as far as corruption goes. So these air quote stakeholders are already people that own properties in those downtowns. They're not going to say no to something like, a, a, you know, a, 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 a Larry Fink or whatever, you know, another Berg that comes in with, you know, with bags full of cash because it, it's kind of like they're the anchor in that downtown. So, again, we, using Long Island as an example, 
there's a couple of shitty downtowns that were never really uh, uh, developed, and they own a large swath of the of the properties in that downtown. There's vagrancies, you know, people doing fentanyl, so on and so forth. Not fentanyl, but heroin. This is before fentanyl. And so when they come along, they have the biggest stake in the downtown. So when this person comes along saying, oh, I'm going to start buying up these properties, uh, oh, you know, for over bidding price, he's not going to say no to it. Right. Because it means it's going to draw more people into his restaurant, to his establishment. But, so I, I'm just trying to understand that I mean, when you say Larry Fink, I mean, it's not Larry Fink walking in there. With we're we're using it as it's, an example. Well, no, but I want to be specific. So, so if Starbucks comes in and says, hey, we want to open the first Starbucks in this town at this corner location. We think it's going to be great. It's going to draw people into the downtown. Um, what does the town say? No, no, they're not going to say no. No, but 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 are you saying they should say no? They could. I'm well, saying they well, could. Okay, let, let's let's use a few places in like uh, let's say uh, North Carolina, for could. example. They they've already had passed laws stating you can you cannot have a chain in this downtown. Okay, so there has but here's the thing: you had to have that policy in place, somewhat grandfathered in, long before you implemented any type of smart growth policy. And unfortunately, very few towns have implemented those policies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's kind of too so late. if it's grandfathered in, it's basically a big middle finger. Like you can't get rid of this policy, saying those chain stores are allowed within an X X amount of uh, uh, square miles. Mm -hmm. To answer your question, uh, expat, I think um, so. What, what you were asking is basically, what is a municipality supposed to do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, if if Starbucks wants to come in and pay double the rent of mom and pop coffee shop, yeah. Why the fuck would you ever not do it? Why would you say no to that, right? Right. And that's exactly what's happening. This is exactly why this happens. Mm -hmm. So in Livingston, Montana, which is actually a very nice town, not at all like three fourths. It's like a, it's actually very like you know kitschy and nice and all. Montana's trying to come in there, and the locals are trying to kick it out. So why do the locals want to kick out Starbucks? Like, why do you think? Well, uh, you know, for all the reasons we talked about, right, it probably um, uh, represents uh, global monoculture. It's not authentic. It, um, it it might, you know, it might lead to problems with homeless people um, camping out in the bathrooms. Bathrooms, exactly. Right. So they say, you know, we in this article about them trying to move to to to. Uh, to Livingston, they're saying local businesses add 250% more funds to the city than the business. So, you know, you, it's, it's this is a, entirely an I drink your milkshake problem. And you're, you're saying like, okay, well, what are they supposed to do about it? Are they supposed to legislate against it? Are they supposed to say no? Are they supposed to blow up the Starbucks? You know, what are they supposed to do? And this is exactly the problem. That's why this is that's why this is the weakness that we're dealing with. We're dealing with this weakness because Blackstone can buy anything it wants, including single family homes all across the country, right? And how do you stop it? How do we stop this? I don't know. I don't have an answer. Like, I, I genuinely, I, because you're right, like, do we legislate a law? Doesn't seem like that would work because then they're just going to make their LLC some other name and then it's going to be Twig and Whistle, which it already is, right? You know, so it's like, then it's going to be the foundry. Dude, in, in Long Beach, the number one local brewery of Long Beach, where I used to live in, in California, is Ballast Point. Ballast Point is a hedge fund. <laughs> it has absolutely nothing to do with Long Beach. But a bunch of people in Long Beach think, oh, this is my local brewery, mm -hmm. right? How do you solve that problem? I have no fucking idea. Mm -hmm. I wish I knew. All I can do is talk about it. It's fascinating. I mean, do you have any, like, sense of what percentage of businesses in Bozeman, for example, um, are locally owned as opposed to, you know, owned by some sort of megacorp uh, you know, some VC, um, because I mean, obviously I don't know. And, and I'm kind of, you know, when I look around in the, in the towns that I visit, it seems like, it seems like even locally owned businesses are starting to adopt this, 
the sort yeah. of generic industrial chic architecture, yeah. uh, metal trays to serve food, you know, craft beer. I, and, and, you know, related question, uh, do people actually like craft beer or is that <laughs> like a psyop that's being pushed on the it, nation? Is the craft beer even really craft beer? It's real. It's like craft. And What's I, the difference I, between craft beer and just beer? <laughs> let, let, let me take that. Number one is in uh, in New York State, they give tax abatements to people that own microbreweries, so you don't have to pay taxes if you open an IPA for ten wow. years straight. Wow. So I don't know if that's implemented in other states, but I'm going to safely assume it is at least on some on some scale. Maybe not as big as New York State because a huge, there's a huge tax base. That's number one. Number two. You're talking about uh, the percentages of, like, let's say, hedge funds or LLCs versus uh, locally owned property. What happens is, is let's say it, it, one of these large hedge funds gets their uh, gets their nose underneath the tent. What they do is, again, bribing city council start implementing certain aspects of smart growth. So, for example, uh, if you're there's a mechanic shop near the uh, cork and taps. Well, that's that's a non-conforming entity. It mean meaning it's blight, and it doesn't fit or or adhere to the smart growth policy. So what they'll do is they'll start uh, going after that local mechanic shop for various environmental regulations. Oh, do you have a car on your property that's not registered nor does it have a license plate? We're just going to show up in the middle of the night and tow that car. And they make it really difficult for that individual to sustain to, to sustain their business in that uh, in particular location. Great example, kill dozer. Yeah, it happened to kill dozer in Colorado. He had a muffler shop. It didn't adhere to the local statutes as far as what his blight goes. So they started making it more and more difficult for him to operate his muffler shop business. So that's just one example, and that was back in 2004. So is that why so many of these revitalized downtowns that I visit, like in the South, for example, like they seem to be, I would say like at least 90% of the establishments in the downtown are food or beverage. Yes. There's, There's like nothing else. I There's mean, nothing it's just else. incredible. So, so, so if you have a junkyard near uh, uh, to dogs and tap, you you gotta you, you gotta go. So they just make it harder and harder for you to operate your business. They keep hitting you with different violations, and they they decide on which violation they're gonna hit hit you with. So it's on paper, but then they decide. Uh, you know, it's not selective like it's, enforcement. It's selective enforcement. Thank yeah. you. Cork and canine. Wow, that's I didn't know that. That's yeah, that's a great. Uh, yeah, cool again, I, we, uh, my best my best friend was trying to buy a property uh, near the Long Island Railroad, and it was a mechanic shop. And he told us stories that they would just show up, the the city, the town would just cut, show up in the middle of the night and start towing his cars away. Jeez. And, and, and you know he 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 he's steadfast. He wants like an exuberant amount of money because he knows how much that property's worth because he knows what they want to build there. But he's like, no, I'm not going to leave until you give me this amount this amount of money. And what eventually happens to guys like him is they they just hit it with blight. They hit you with eviction notices, and they do um, what is it? Um, what is when the the when the state comes on uh, eminent domain? They just come along and eminent domain, and they give you they cut you a check and say fuck off. And never forget the interstate uh, uh, interstate highway system was not the hand uh, was not the work of the uh, free hand of the market. Yeah, no, that was Eisenhower. Yep. So unfortunately, like uh, circling back, a lot of these things have been in place for uh, for a long time. It's just they decided to roll this all out, you know, thirty years later. Yes. And that's what people don't seem to realize. You know, when you try to show, you know, I remember showing people some of these PDF files, you know, 10, 15 years ago. I'm like, look, they got they got satellite images of your laundromat. Like they're they're gonna go after your laundromat because it's a non-conforming entity. That's communism. That'll never happen here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's it's my rights, my constitution. Mm -hmm. And they First kind of left the off. And it's so funny. I get so many text messages and emails and phone calls saying, oh my God. Lamprey, you were right the entire time. You know, everyone thought I was completely nuts about it. But again, you can see it happening. Like Isaac was saying, it's it's it, whether it's in Charleston, North Carolina, it, it's happened in Bozeman, Montana. Man, and is is that? And that, 
Is that, Isaac, is that just the beginning? Because I, I, I just first read your article earlier today. Um, and is there a hint of possibly conflict arising between political divides based on these monoculture? Right. So, the, yeah, that, that, that's the part of this we haven't discussed at all, which is who's the losers in all this? Right. You know, who, who are the people who are getting screwed? And the people who are getting screwed are the people who have been getting screwed for the past two decades, which is the white working class. Yeah. Right? It's like you go, you know, I before Trump got elected, I went and did a road trip for, this was actually for Vice, but they never ended up getting published for obvious reasons. But uh, I, I did a road trip all throughout the Midwest. So I went to Youngstown, Ohio, and Detroit, and Pittsburgh, and, you know, the Rust Belt, right? And it looks like Youngstown, Ohio, uh, you know, Gary, Indiana, look like Syria. <laughs> like, it, it literally looks like somebody nuked it from space. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it looks like it got nuked, like straight up. It is destroyed. And when something like that happens, there's going to be a consequence. You know, it's, it, that the, something like that doesn't just happen. You know, like, like uh, suddenly millions of people suddenly have no jobs and the entire society that they lived in is gone. Okay, you think that that's not going to have any consequence? And that's what Trump is. Trump is the response to that, right? And that's what, why, you know, I knew he was going to get elected because I'd seen it and I, I knew, oh, yeah, these, th these people are so mad. They're so angry because their lives got destroyed, more or less, you know, right? So that class, this white working blue collar class, are the people who gave birth to Trumpism and they're the people who are losing out yet again in this situation of these banks taking over. And why are they losing out? Because they used to run these stores. You know, they used to run the coffee shop. They used to run the bar. They used to have jobs here that are now what's all happening. Oh, the 10% low income work, play, live. Who's coming there? It's not people from Montana. Sure as fuck not. Right? Right. So, you know, uh, they're mad. They're really fucking mad. And I went to, you know, I, as I said in the beginning of this, I don't know if I said it. I can't remember if I was on the record. But I randomly ended up in Three Forks, Montana, which is 20 minutes away from Bozeman. But nobody ever goes to Three Forks. There's no reason to go there. The only reason I went there is because we got kicked out of the hotel because, uh, there was a Kenny Chesney concert happening. So we were in Bozeman. We had to leave. So we went to Three Forks. The, the Sodomites were coming, so they had, they had to make room yeah. for the Sodomites. Okay. Dude, exactly. <laughs> we, went, we went to Three Forks, Montana. It is bright red, ultra bright red Trump country. Did I say this in the I can't remember if I said this in the beginning. No, no. no. Uh, anyway, so it was the, the anger that those people have is palpable. I didn't even notice it. My wife went out and like right when we got there, my wife went out for a walk uh, with the baby. She was like, this place is like really dark and creepy. Like I, she was like, I got yelled at by like three different people. <laughs> <laughs> like, like literally you go to this place. It feels like the hood. It feels like, like the ghetto in Chicago. Right. It's like, like these people are fucking mad. They're white. And, and they look at you like not, they're not happy with you, you know? And, and every bumper sticker is Trump, 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 Trump flags everywhere. Trailer parks everywhere. Like this group of people is not like the country. You know, we used to have this idea of, oh, the, the nice Christian country white people. That's not true anymore, man. Like these people are fucking angry. And so... That was what the article was really about, was like, I ended up in this weird, weird place, Three Forks, which is 20 minutes away from ultra gay, third wave coffee, Bozeman, and you have hardcore Trump land, like right there.
Do you think that the, the local high schools from those towns play together? Well, I don't think that. I mean, the, <laughs> the, the locals are probably all... I mean, I don't... I, I doubt there's that many, like, woke liberal kids there yet, right? Because right. they're probably not... They don't live there fully. So probably all the kids are, you know, fucking racist, which is like, can you blame them? No. You know, it's like, like, yeah, they're, 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 they've seen what's happened and they know these people are going to come take their shit and then take them out of jobs, take them out of everything, pay them no money and then call them racist, you know? Yeah. And so they're like, they're like, fuck you. You know, they're like they're really spoiling for a fight. And so that's why I titled the article what I did, because it does seem like the battle lines are set in a way that they've never been set before. You know, because it, what, what it says to me is like, if you start fucking with these people in a certain way, it's going to take one little thing before it boils over into like a real conflict. Because they, they, they're they so angry. And, and you can just see it. And everything about them is like, they're now aware who has, you know, is in control, right? And I think the people who are in control, the rainbow flag people, the private equity groups, you know, it's so funny. You look at, like, uh, look at any of these development banks that are in, like, Latin America, right? So look at the uh, Inter-American Development Bank, right? These are the people who come in and let China buy a bunch of, you know, in debt Chile for a bunch of infrastructure projects. Look at their Instagram. What do you see on their Instagram? A bunch of gay shit. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, you know, you you see a bunch of LGBTQ uh, positive. Why? Why? Why are they doing that? Like, why are the people that are in control putting rainbow flags on everything? The yeah, reason is because that you know they're they're saying this is our world now. Yeah. <clears throat> no, this is this, we own this shit. Is basically what they're saying. They're well, literally they, planting the, their what, flag. What is the? Don't forget, you know. A flag is a marking of a territory. Yeah, it's a pissing right? contest. It's a pissing. So if you, if you're that downtown is full of LGBT flags and no American flags, well, that's a conquered location, is it not? Yeah. 